The following is a presentation of the University of St. Thomas with campuses in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the St. Thomas Alumni Relations webinar series. My name is Jenna Johnson and I am a program manager in the Alumni Relations office. The webinar will last approximately 30 minutes. The last five minutes of the webinar will be used as a questions and answer session with Dr. Victoria Young. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Victoria Young. Dr. Young is a professor of modern architectural history and the chair of the Department of Art History. Hailing from Comfrey, Minnesota, Dr. Young has an undergraduate art history degree from New York University and received her master's and PhD in architectural history from the University of Virginia. Her award-winning 2014 book, St. John's Abbey Church, Marcel Braut Warrior and the Creation of Modern Sacred Space, discusses the masterful collaboration between the architectural team of Marcel Breuer and his associates and their Minnesota Benedictine patrons. Her book was included on Architectural Records 2014 Book Roundup and was heralded by a review by Norman Weinstein for Arch News Now as the first great architectural history of the 21st century. Her current work explores the design of war museums and focuses on the National World War II Museum in New Orleans designed by Vorzinger Architects of New York starting in 2003 with completion expected in 2021. Dr. Young is a former member of Minnesota's Governor's Residence Council and the State Historic Review Board. She currently serves as second vice president of the national organization in her field, the Society of Architectural Historians, and will become the organization's president in 2021. Today she will talk about the sacred spaces at the University of St. Thomas campuses. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Victoria Young. Thank you, Jenna. It's great to be here today. Thanks for having me. Um, just wanted to say hello to everybody out there. Thank you for joining us today. It's really fun to be able to talk about the sacred spaces in St. Thomas and to think about what the sacred can mean in a lot of different settings. I've um, spent my life thinking about these spaces and teaching them, being a part of them, engaging with them. And you know, America is a country that was founded on the pursuit of religious freedom. And the role of faith in America can be seen um, in a lot of different venues, from the smallest of chapels to the biggest of cathedrals to synagogues, mosques, what have you, but it's also really prevalent on college campuses. And campuses in all regions of the nation contain really fantastic structures that um, help to cultivate moral integrity in our, in our youth and also serve as a way to communicate how we view religion in this country. Jenna, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. So just taking a look at this image, just an example of some things that uh, reveal the sacred in our landscape um, from the works of a master like Frank Lloyd Wright in this upper right-hand corner down at Florida Southern College, um, drawing back all the way to Cambridge and Oxford with their great college campuses in the lower right, um, and then some more um, some buildings that relate to the tradition and the histories of religious architecture going back to the Gothic with the Heinz Chapel in the lower left, um, the chapel down at Notre Dame in lower center, and then more modern buildings like the Air Force Academy Chapel in the upper left, and then one that some of you might know, the uh, Breuer Church up at St. John's in Collegeville. And this is, you know, speaks to this kind of uh, vision and visual that architecture can provide when it comes to sacred space. So just a little bit about me and where I come from, um, thinking about this background. I grew up in a really small town. I grew up on a farm, actually, in southern Minnesota, outside of Comfrey. And I was always surprised in these little towns how many different churches there were. And um, at that point in my life, not a lot of synagogues or other sacred spaces, but just a lot of um, space bringing their architectural language to the landscapes of the area where I was growing up in. So I think that kind of stuck with me over the years. And when it came time to do my master's degree at the University of Virginia, I started working on the building in the upper left corner here. Uh, the big tower at, of that church and the transept to the right, or actually the nave to the right of that tower, were done later. But everything else is from 1840. And it was done by an architect named Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin, who was building architecture for the Catholics in England in the 19th century, which if you know English history, is pretty important because the Catholics had been suppressed since the time of Henry VIII um, and Elizabeth I, really. But into the 19th century, 1829, these acts of um, suppression get rid of some of those um, 
problems for the Catholics, and one of those is then they can worship in public again. So my master's thesis allowed me to spend time living with the Trappist monks on that site, and Trappists are um, Cistercian monks who embrace silence, a vow of silence, so they really don't talk, but um, the thing for me that was really joyful there is the archivist loved to talk, I think, because he couldn't talk otherwise, and we would spend a lot of time just really thinking about that space. So that kind of set me on a course of working with monastics, which is a really fantastic thing uh, for a lot of reasons. They're incredibly kind, generous, giving. You get to live on site, really be a part of their daily routine, which is very elaborate, you know, saying prayers all different times of the day. Um, in fact, the Cistercians here, I think we had seven prayer services during that day, and uh, starting at 4 a.m., going till 10 o'clock at night. So it's a really big commitment to be a part of a group like that. But it's also they keep really fantastic records. So um, you can get a look at the past through all the things that they've been saving. So that set me up on a trajectory that then moved into working on Breuer's Church up at St. John's for uh, my dissertation at the University of Virginia, and then ultimately the book. And again, um, I know St. John's is our rival in a lot of things. I, em I embrace that, but I embrace it in a really positive way. And so do they, and so do all the people here at St. Thomas, right? We have this really hearty competition with them, but also it's a really lovely thing. In fact, Johnny's Mary Tommy's all the time, right, Jenna? And um, so it's been a real pleasure for me to work on this project and have the support not only of St. Thomas, but of St. John's. As I looked into, again, monastics, in this case Benedictines, um, working with an architect, Marcel Breuer, whose name probably isn't too familiar to most of you, uh, but he was a very important architect in the middle of the 20th century who was taking modernism, in particular the use of concrete, to new levels in his designs. This was the first sacred space he'd ever done, and it was a result of a really um, powerful collaboration between the Benedictines as patrons, kind of coaching Breuer, who was born and raised as a Jew, and then renounced his Judaism when the Nazis started to rise in power in Germany. And just coming together, putting art into this building, and creating this visual marker. And I think if you know St. John's, anything they're doing with logos, things like that, this bell banner is front and center. So that you know, has been part of the progression. And what I've come to work on now, as Jenna mentioned, is the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, which you're thinking, well, okay, what's sacred about that? But anybody who has a connection to somebody who served in the war, um, particularly World War I, World War II, uh, you know what a powerful thing that was and how really enveloping that was of American well, culture in every um, country that was involved in the conflict. And so when vets go to these sites you know, and engage with them, maybe they can't get back to the beaches of Normandy anymore or over to Midway, wherever it might be that they served, but it allows them to connect with that moment, which I just, some of the most fascinating time for me in more museums are when I watch vets go through them. It's so powerful. I mean, I just think about what they must be thinking because I can't even put myself into that place. And I have a brother-in-law in the military, but it's not the same really anymore in that kind of sense of worldwide conflict. And the thing at the World War II Museum, though, that I've really been thinking a lot about lately is their sacred space. So here's a look at the site. Um, it was started in 2003, but redesigned in 2007 after Katrina. And so what you're looking at are a number of buildings, pavilions that relate to different themes from the war, and then this great canopy element that's going to cover this landscape of this central parade ground. And so on the right, you can see what they've got built so far, a couple of buildings yet coming to be. Um, Liberation Pavilion right here will showcase the time after the war, and then the Hall of Democracy, which is a special exhibition, and their kind of research think tank are yet to be built along with that canopy. And it's a language of concrete, glass, and steel um, designed by an architecture firm out of New York City called Borsanger Architects, who partner with a firm in New Orleans called Mathis Briere, to you know create a language of how we commemorate war, and then fill this with museum exhibitions, largely done by Patrick Gallagher out of Maryland and his associates. And what's become kind of fascinating for me here is that inside of Liberation is a chapel. And I've been thinking a lot about, in this graduate and undergraduate seminar I'm teaching right now this spring, is sacred space in areas where we don't typically expect it, in this case in particular, in war museums and memorials. 
And this is just a fly through that Borsanger's team did, oh gosh, 2012, so a while ago now. And this building is just in serious design right now, so probably going to come to be in the next two years. That canopy element will start going um, into erection this June. The pieces will be coming in to start putting that up. But what does it mean to have sacred space in a secular setting? And how do we use that? It has to be a space that um, works for multi-denominations that can uh, fit not only different iconographies, or perhaps in this case, you see a very modern contemporary building with no iconography, right? So it can really relate in a lot of different ways. And then these 30-foot walls are able to open up and slide back. So a 50-person chapel inside um, can become a much larger and more engaged space with that parade ground outside. So it's been fun sitting in on design sessions with the team and kind of getting their sensibilities for the sacred spaces they think are important and, and what that means. And this is really an architect and a client-driven moment down here at World War II. So that's just kind of where I've gone over the years with this all. But it comes back to St. Thomas, obviously, because this is where I live, work, teach, play, I mean, all these things. And I'm really interested in having my students and the community at large really understand what the landscape here means when they leave. You know, you don't, you went to St. Thomas, um, you probably can talk about a few things architecturally, but, you know, what does everything mean? So in the art history department, we use the landscape, um, the buildings, our collections, our exhibitions, as our common text for our students. So we can really connect with that. You know, whether it's in St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel, and that's, in that upper left-hand image, that's Cardinal Ratzinger at the time, former Pope Benedict here at St. Thomas, um, to the law school, and then over on the right-hand side, those images of the chapel in the Bernardi campus at Rome. You know, these places of settings for really important moments in our lives. And when I talk to uh, students, it's, you know, college is such a big deal. It really is. And um, these spaces all make part of that happen. So let me just tell you a little bit more about them all. Of course, it all goes back to Archbishop John Ireland, who started this place out in um, 1880, well, in the 1880s, right? Um, leader of the archdiocese, really determined to make this a school that was not connected with a monastic order, but that would be tied to the archdiocese more directly. And at the 1904 World's Fair in Chicago, he finds the architect Emmanuel Louis Masqueray. Masqueray, um, tell you a little bit more about him in a second, was down there designing the grounds for that World's Fair, and Ireland got him back to the cities to do work for him, including the Cathedral of St. Paul and the Pro Cathedral, which is now the Basilica of St. Mary. And think about that. Those are two huge buildings going up at exactly the same time because Ireland didn't want one city to feel slighted over the other, right, and to kind of share that. But that starts masquerade on this trajectory that's so intertwined to what Ireland is doing. But before we get to the story of Masquerade here on campus, just a little bit about how we were using sacred space prior to that. Um, in the administration building in the upper left-hand corner, you can also see it in the photo too, sitting high up on the ridge, kind of where Dowling is now. Uh, there was a chapel on the main floor that students were using that started out as a school. Um, and then that little wooden building on the right-hand side is from 1891. The admin building actually goes back to 1876 and then renovated in 1886 but just a little wooden chapel that was very simple, um, kind of gothic in its details, very kind of Minnesota Prairie architecture, exactly what you find kind of all across the upper Midwest. And inside 1907, just the look of really, really simple space. But the school continued to grow, and so Ireland realizes that something needs to be done, and here comes Masquerade. So once you know they make this connection with each other, uh, it's really for life, and it really takes Masquerade to all sorts of places. We've got an exhibition on Masquerade's work at St. Thomas up right now in the lobby gallery of OEC, because it's the 100th anniversary of his death, as you can see. So a lot of us around town who have Masquerade buildings have come together. We did a panel with some important historians and members of the community to really think about his work, because I think a lot of people don't know his name, but a lot of people know his buildings and the kind of a mark he's left on the landscape of the Upper Midwest is pretty fantastic, really dozens of buildings. So Masquerade came from France. He went to a school called the École des Beaux-Arts, which was really significant at the time, the most important art and architecture school in the world. And to be admitted to the École, you had to send in a whole dossier and get accepted, and then your way was paid. But any um, American architect 
where his weight and salt was going or trying to go to the Ecole. And um, so Masqueray is there. What he's learning at the Ecole is also really significant because a lot of people think about the Ecole as just kind of telling people to understand the history of classical architecture. So taking Greek and Roman temples and being able to translate that into architecture of symmetry and kind of massiveness monumentality with a lot of ornament and decoration. But indeed, members of the Ecole were working on cast iron buildings. They were looking at Gothic structures for their structure. So it was a really broad education. They were drawing um, sculpture in this courtyard to understand the arts more fully. And they were also really thinking about the practical, pragmatic elements of architecture. And so an Ecole um, process of design would include all of those things. It was much more than just a kind of here's the tradition of architecture and that's all it is. It was really a complex thing. Masqueray leaves Paris, comes to America, and um, stops in New York City for a little bit. Um, spends some time there. 1887, he arrives in New York. Finally comes to the Midwest in 1904 to do the fair and then up here to the upper Midwest. But in New York, he works with important architects, Carrere and Hastings, who did the New York Public Library and a lot of other things, and an architect named Richard Morris Hunt, who was the first American at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and brought that training system back to America. The other reason this is significant is because it then becomes a basis for architecture schools in the country to teach students. First one's at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, then Penn has one, so it becomes the way to go. And it's really not until after World War II that we see a shift from architecture schools using that Ecole des Beaux-Arts method to something much more modern. Um, Masqueray knew the value of that relationship with Ireland, absolutely. And he signed, like I said, his correspondence, your architect. So there was something really powerful for those men with each other. And here's Masqueray in his studio, and I love this photo. Um, the gentleman on the left, the African-American, was Masqueray's valet named Percival Haskins. And Masqueray um, died um, suddenly on a streetcar in St. Paul. And Haskins was his closest person and in fact controlled his possessions and everything and really was the one who took charge of things after Masqueray died. Um, so there he is in his office working away. But the Chapel of St. Thomas Aquinas is the, the gift we have from Masquerade on our campus as a sacred space. Um, started in 1916, announced by Ireland that it was going to happen. Um, anonymous donation comes in to make it happen. It's probably from Ireland too. But it allows this moment of transition here to really go from that very simple, um, basic, vernac almost vernacular chapel, that Gothic wooden revival, to something much more powerful up on the North Campus. And so this beautiful use of brick, um, this use of symmetry, and really kind of wonderful crafting of a lot of different architectural elements, uh, the circular window over the entry, a rose window like we find in a lot of Gothic buildings, but with a kind of more regularized tracery that holds all the glass within it. Um, it's longitudinal in plan like a Latin cross, and um, we enter up to kind of a podium level and work our way into the building. And this is a really beautiful photo by um, university photographer Mike Eckern. Uh, we commissioned him to do some work for the Masquerade Show, and he got this one on a really nice morning this winter. So that's fun. And then, you know, we had the chance to go through the archives and really look at this. So Maria Wearing Peterson, who's currently the editor of the Catholic Spirit, former student of mine, um, I brought her back to guest curate the show because she'd done some work on Masquerade uh, at the Basilica and Cathedral and really knows his, his process and everything incredibly well. So along with her and then Maria Thompson, my program manager, who's another former student, she designed the show for us. And then we worked with Ann Kenny in the library archives, and Ann pulled out all this stuff for us. We had students involved, because we also looked at Ireland and Grace Hall as well. So everybody was kind of crafting this little moment together. But it's fun to go back and look at these, because you know, in a lot of ways, um, it really hasn't changed very much. Particularly on the outside, it really hasn't changed. And so it's fun to see how it's represented in things like the K Cadet yearbook in 1918, which is very cool. And then I just want you to kind of look at the sighting of the chapel on the campus. So what you see in these images, and particularly if you look in the lower left-hand corner here, this is the administration hall. That's Ireland, which comes from 1912, which Masqueray has done too as well. And the thing we found out in kind of researching the process later is that these buildings, you see they're all in this angle to Cleveland here. There's actually a ridge that runs here and then slopes off down to this area 
where there used to be a lake, like Menace, which has been drained, and I guess there's a place you can go in the library and still hear, the, or go by the pipe where the water runs, it's still draining that lake. I've never been down there. I've got to talk to my friends in the physical plant and get in there at some point. But that's why we have this, you know, kind of orientation on the angle of this um, instead of on a more, what, we're, what we see in the rest of campus now as it's built up later, and I'll get to that in a second. There's, you know, football field, pitch and all that thing. That's a hockey rink. And also the front door of the chapel faces out into the community. And that's really Ireland saying, you know, we, we're part of this community. We want to engage. Ireland's incredibly interesting because he was trying to take all these immigrant groups that were coming to America and really unite them under an American Catholicism, almost to the dismay, well, to the dismay of the Vatican at times. But he really saw that immigrant group as part of a bigger picture. So it's part of an outreach that Ireland's trying to get to. Um, here's what the chapel looks like when it's completed. I imagine some of you may not have seen these before if you've been in the space in the last 20, 30 years. But that altar is pushed all the way up to the back wall. That makes perfect sense. Doors going out. Chapels on the side are not pass-throughs on the right and left-hand side. You can see the pulpits on the left. It'll move to the right occasionally. And the celebrant will be saying mass with his back to you in this chapel. And notice how far the pews come up. I mean, all the way to the front. So masquerade dies. Edwin Lundy, who's another great Minnesota architect, completes the building. And um, at this point, it's undecorated. So in the 40s, um, IAA O'Shaughnessy commissions the interior chapel work, including this beautiful window of the Trinity, which is up over the choir in the back end. Just really fantastic. We had all these windows of praise um, last summer. Um, <laughs> it's pretty, it was pretty fascinating to get that report. Every stained glass window on campus was a praise, so we have nice documentation of that. And then here's a look at graduation in 1940 how that laid out. So you can see the chapel is just really white, right? It's just basic. It hasn't been put in. So here's what it looks like after O'Shaughnessy gets in there. In 78 too, we have this change. Um, you can see the altar screen up here, this marble screen, which is copied after the screen inside the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican, so Michelangelo's work there. But what's happened is the altar has been pulled out from the back wall. And that's a result of the Second Vatican Council. So in 1962, from 1962 to 1965, um, the Vatican calls their Second Council an attempt really to modernize the Catholic Church. It's kind of the basic, simplest way to describe it. And part of that is to allow for architectural settings that facilitate um, ecumenism, really bring together the laity and the clergy in the same space so backs aren't turned toward each other. So we're looking at the altar as one focal point together in unison. So that's why this altar comes outside of the screen. Around the perimeter, uh, where you see the script, is this, um, which comes from Romans. And you know it's part of a whole iconographic program. And Monsignor Lavin did a really great book on the chapel that we still have copies of around campus, and some in the bookstore, I think, too. And you can get a sense of all the imagery in there. Of course, related to St. Thomas Aquinas, related to education, but related to the faith and thinking about how the faith can impact a, a college student, a college student, which in turn, if you go and read our mission, you read something like this, you read the St. Thomas mission, it's the same thing in different words. Um, it was another renovation happened in 2008. This is the most recent. Um, this was done um, in order to kind of, you know, bring the place up to date, line it all up, get some more visibility to the choir end where a liturgic choir performs and that sort of thing. Um, you can see this wonderful crucifix under this kind of crown of thorns being um, explained by the glass up above. And then the bronze screen, actually I'll go back here for a second. This bronze screen here is about seven feet tall and these doors taller, about twice as tall again with the four evangelists on them. And these are the two artists who completed that work. Father James Notabart, um, has some architecture training, art training, done a lot of work as a liturgical coordinator, so someone pulling together all aspects of the interior in accordance with church teachings. Um, lots of experience all across the state and the upper Midwest. And Alexander Tilovich is the artist he contracted with, who is from Belarus, um, now living in St. Paul, and has done a lot of art around our sacred spaces in the upper Midwest, including this really beautiful crucifix here made out of bronze. Um, and above that crown of thorns is made out of what's known as dichroic glass, which is glass where um, a non-translucent glass is fused with glass that has metals in it. 
So it actually changes color depending on where you are looking at it. Um, NASA uses it for a lot of things, and that's kind of how Tilovich got a hold of it. And I just saw um, Mr. Tilovich recently at our masquerade panel, so it's always fun to connect with him again. But what this does is it allows a focal point back over the altar. So the altar, um, which is made out of wood and bronze, masquerade used those materials a lot, and Tilovich really, and Notabart really did their work, kind of searching through masquerade's career to find those moments is movable, the lectern is movable, those doors are movable. So trying to create some flexibility within this space too, but get us a visual to the choir. That organ had come in in the 80s, and that's really beautiful. You know, 35 feet tall, over 2,700 pipes on that. Um, and just, you know, really livening and freshening up this space to a way that we can use it more effectively today. But I want to go back to the campus for a second because we've got other places on here. So I've kind of worked this through St. Thomas Aquinas. But here's the 1930 master plan for the campus. And um, what that was was an attempt by the university to right the ship, so to speak, after some interesting times in the 20s. So they brought in the Holy Cross Fathers from Notre Dame to kind of take care of everything from finances to buildings to all these sorts of things. And the Holy Cross Fathers knew the work of McGinnis and Walsh architects out of Boston very well. Um, they'd done some work at Notre Dame. They'd done a lot of Gothic revival spaces across the country. And so they asked them to create this plan for us. And the Gothic revival, the collegiate Gothic, can be traced back to Cambridge, Oxford, back to the Middle Ages, right? And it's this connection between education and religion. And really the great universities started in the Middle Ages, so it makes kind of perfect sense. And it makes sense for a campus. And, um, in doing so, what you see is a little bit different than what we've got, right? When you look at this plan, that huge centered tower where the arches are now is not completed, Aquinas Hall, and then what Albertus Magnus Hall, and then a whole bunch of other buildings that are going to be Gothic Revival, kind of back off of Summit Avenue there. But if you look in the upper left-hand corner at this element right here, I'm wondering if you know what that might be, and I know I can't get an answer from you now, but I always ask my students this. And what it is, is a covered football field. Think about that. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? 1930 master plan. So over the years, we've done little pieces for the magazine and for Founders Day and that sort of Heritage Day on the campus with students. And uh, we were able to uncover some of these images. I mean, Ann Kenny had found these a long time ago. But what we found in the archives one year was a letter from the architect that the Holy Cross Fathers were working with um, or between, from actually the Holy Cross Father who was in charge to this architect saying, and in that covered stadium, we would like a movable roof. Ha, <laughs> I know, right? So 1930, they were talking about a movable roof on the stadium. And, you know, for some people, football stadiums are sacred space. So I'm just throwing that out there because, you know, never know. But here's the campus in 41. And what I want to point out is look what's there yet, right? Upper left-hand corner, chapel, Ireland Hall. They've always been real center moments in this, in this new plan. And you can see Aquinas is up on the right, so starting to build out that project. Um, I brought this in, too, because this is 45. This is right after World War II, and I'm trying to re-envision campus. Um, the campus had been filled in with some temporary or was going to be filled in with temporary housing known as Tomtown eventually. But what you see here is that Gothic Revival front, and then this really symmetrical, formal courtyard, right? Um, actually green space in between here, these quadrangles that lead us back to this hemicycle here. And what's in this area is a war memorial. So that was fascinating to me. And did you know that we have a war memorial on campus? Behind the chapel of St. Thomas Aquinas is Our Lady of Victory, Queen of Peace. 1950, done by an Italian sculptor. This was um, a memorial that started out in 1942 um, from the mothers of St. Thomas students and St. Thomas cadets at the prep school who had served in the war. So World War I, World War II, and others. And there's a book with all their names on it that's in the archive. This statue now is back there. And I don't know if you can know, but go look at her sometimes because she's holding a sword in front of her. It's really um, a beautiful, lovely thing. And just this past summer, uh, the Bernardi family um, gave us a nice gift that allowed us to really open this space up and make it usable. It had become kind of 
a place people weren't really gathering in or going to. So now there's benches there, there's grass to sit on, and that statue is the focus of this new peace garden, which is really a lovely contemplative space. And that's another way to think of the sacred, right? You know, these individual kind of moments you have with it. Other spaces on campus that are sacred, um, the Chapel of St. Mary built for the seminary in 1905. So before Ma um, Masqueray's work at St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel, Clarence Johnson, one of our great Minnesota architects as well, drawing on the language of the Romanesque, very simple, um, over the tympanum, um, the Annunciation to the Virgin, this is Kettle River Sandstone, a lovely building anchoring that space on the south campus for the seminary. Here's an, some images of what the interior looked like before the renovation. So uh, Archbishop Dowling was very good friends with an artist named Bansel Lafarge. Lafarge goes out to the East Coast, or that's where he's from, and really an important American artist in the early 20th century, did work um, at the cathedral as well. And I had a student do a really great independent study on this last spring with me. And I just wanted to show you this beautiful mural. It's actually painted on canvas and then affixed to the wall. And the kind of wonderful marble revetment pieces below it, but really powerful color-wise, right? And so this is then flipped around in the 80s by Rafferty Rafferty Tollefson and Linda Key with Frank Kazmarczyk as a liturgical coordinator. Frank was also the liturgical coordinator up at St. John's. Um, he's, that was his life career too after being an art teacher at St. John's for a while. But this complete reorientation of the building and also this complete reduction of its visual impact, I guess you could say. Um, so where you're, this picture is taken here is that same end where that apse was all colored with the murals by Lafarge, um, but reoriented to allow entry from the School of Divinity's new entry portico, gathering space, that sort of thing. So tying that all together. And then on the North Campus for the undergraduates, the Chapel of St. John Vianney, um, started in 84, redesigned in 97 um, as a worship space for the undergraduate seminarians. And I'm not sure if the numbers hold yet today, but just a few years ago, we had the largest undergraduate seminary in the country, um, numbers-wise. So a really important place um, for young men to think about their future as priests or whatever may happen. Um, the imagery there is very simple. You come in through this little entry narthex that you see students sitting here and we're on a little tour, in through these doors to this main worship space. There's a little auxiliary space off to the right, and then this kind of imagery of the Eucharist. But very simple, you know, white walls, pan, light furnishings, not too much sculpture. But since they're growing so much, I understand that there is a renovation and addition in process up there as well. Um, so that'll be really interesting to see it. And then, of course, on the Minneapolis campus in the law school, right there is the Chapel to St. Thomas More, which was done by Tillovich and Notabard again. So 2005, before they came in and did the redo of St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel, of course, St. Thomas More, a great lawyer, um, back in the day for Henry VIII, uh, walking in this kind of simple, again, contemplative space, using some images, but really speaking with a kind of contemporary language. And when I talked with Father Notabard about this space, what he was telling me about were the atom experiments that were going on in the early 20th century. And he was seeing just some visualizations of these things. And so that led him to thinking about glass that could represent that. And you have to really see this in person and see the images. You can kind of get a little bit down in the lower left-hand corner of the interior, but it's got a wonderful patterning in this yellow glass um, with some holes cut out to allow the world in and allow you to look out, but not completely. Um, and again, this kind of flexibility of space, the altar at the center, the crucifix above it again, directing our focus to the altar, lectern there to the left, the Blessed Sacrament tabernacle to the right. And then up and above, if you're looking at this image, looking back out to the back, kind of contemplative space that you can get into as well. And then in the Catholic Studies House, um, this is almost 10 years ago now, wow. Um, this renovation to their chapel there. They had another chapel space up on the second floor, but were able to convert um, with some gifts of some really generous donors uh, the space below into a chapel that holds as many as 50 and reusing elements of other sacred spaces because this is kind of a common thing, right? And it's in every faith. You know, sometimes as the faith diminishes and every year we see the percentage of people who associate with the faith diminish when the Pew Charitable Trust does their research and things like that. So what does that mean? It means we close sacred spaces. So what happens to those sacred spaces? Well, sometimes they're converted into nightclubs, 
right? I mean, they're decommissioned, but then converted. But sometimes those elements from the buildings just go into a storehouse and you can get them. So that's what happened here. The windows that you see around this chapel dedicated to Albertus Magnus, who was um, St. Thomas Aquinas' teacher, uh, he, um, and also very important church doctor, all those sorts of things. They come from the Church of the Sacred Heart in Lawrence, Massachusetts. The, we purchased them from the Archdiocese of Boston for $62,000 and change in January 2009. That church happened to be French. The Paris was French. So the imagery in those is Mary and Joseph, which you know is everything, but uh, Saint Louis or Saint Louis of France, King of France, um, Joan of Arc is in there, uh, Saint Augustine, Saint Albert. So I mean, just kind of this connectivity that comes in a really fantastic way there. And I just wanted to share with you too. We have these sacred spaces, but we also have a really lovely sacred art collection at Saint Thomas that we run out of the art history department. And these are examples of crucifixes that Father Deese has donated to us over the years. Gifts from his travels or gifts or things he purchased on his travels, that sort of thing. But you just take a look at these. They're coming from all over the world. They're all sorts of different materials. Um, we have Russian icons in this collection as well. I mean, just a really fantastic um, sorting of the different ways that you can express the sacred through the same kind of element. And so hopefully we're always kind of working to get these on display. We had these on display, I think, about three or four years ago. And looking now to find kind of a permanent place for them on campus so people can see them and engage with them as well. Uh, but that's just part of it, right? I mean, it's about people who believe in a certain thing who come to St. Thomas, about these spaces that can sustain that. And I really look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Young. That was a fascinating presentation. I know I learned a lot, and I'm sure our alumni audience did as well. We are going to move into the questions and answers session. There is a text box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Feel free to um, comment and send some questions to us, and Dr. Young will get to as many as she can in the time that we have. We do have a first question, and it is, do these spaces still serve the community well? That's a great question. I mean, I think we've seen, you know, with all the renovations and the additions of spaces as we build new buildings, that we're always thinking about the best way that we can serve our students through the buildings that we have on campus. Um, we are in process of, with the new campus master plan that was rolled out as part of our strategic planning initiatives over the last couple of years, uh, one building that's been identified as needing some attention is St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel. Um, it will be not only a renovation that puts air conditioning into it for the first time um, and deals with all the HVAC systems that are inside of it, but I think if you've been to St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel on a mass day where there's a lot of students in the building and you see all the backpacks stacked six high in the little entryway or if you've been a bride and get married there in the little room <laughs> that you're supposed to change in. I mean, there's no reception space we can really use there. Our campus ministry folks are kind of tucked back up in the eaves. So there's some things we need to do to make that building kind of serve the needs we have of today. So um, I'm part of the committee that's actively involved in um, looking for architects and funding to make an addition to that chapel. And you know this gets to a bigger question of, okay, so it's a masquerade building. We're thinking that's important and significant. So what exactly do you do in these moments when you're reconfiguring sacred space? I mean, how do you think about the building itself? Um, do you change things? What does that mean? Are you adding new things? What kind of architectural language do you use with that? And so we're very carefully working through that. Now, none of our buildings are on any kind of official register of historic places. Um, that just hasn't happened with us over the years, but it doesn't mean that the committee and an architectural team working on the chapel is not aware of the importance of Masquerade's work, because a lot of his other buildings are on the register, the National Historic Register, and that sort of thing. So we're thinking about that very, very carefully, wanting to make the least intrusions onto that building, but also wanting to make it useful and practical for the current day. So I think we think really carefully about that, and I don't know too much about the St. John Vianney, um, renovation project that's going on. I do know that Father Michael Becker, who heads that, um, has a lot of time in architecture. He built a really fabulous church out in St. Michael. Uh, so I feel really confident that that's going to go forward incredibly well, too. 
Awesome. The next question is, what became of the painted canvas from the St. Paul Seminary? Do you know? No. <laughs> I don't know. And that's a great question. And I think the student who did this independent study with me is going to turn this into her qualifying paper, which is the master's thesis equivalent. So I will try to find out. If you want to email me um, on the side, I'll get back to you as soon as I find out. But I think it's gone. I think it's gone. Um, the next question is, does the identity of St. Thomas come from the architecture of its sacred spaces or something else, in your opinion? When I think about St. Thomas, I think when we all think about St. Thomas, we think about the Gothic revival forms from Summit Avenue, right, and the use of that, you know, lovely Casota limestone from southern Minnesota. And, and you know, that goes back to 1930. I mean, that's the moment when that all started for us. And now when we build additional buildings, for example, the Student Center, the ARC, the business, the Minneapolis campus, right, you know, that has become our identity. And whenever I'm spending time with students, and I was in London with a colleague and 15 freshmen, you know, I always ask them, you know, well, what happened the first time you came to St. Thomas? You know, why did you come here? And they're like, oh, I love the campus, right? And that means a lot to me because it says that place matters and that we're making a place for people here. We're creating place, um, which is tied to St. Thomas, so it's tied to a Catholic identity and to a Catholic mission. But rarely do I hear people, my students, I should say, other people I talk to, um, talk about the sacred spaces as creating that identity. So I think what, what it is is that they are just part and parcel of this bigger image that we have here, and it all goes together. Um, so does St. Thomas, would people say, oh yeah, I went to St. Thomas because of St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel? Somebody might. Somebody might, but I don't think that's where it's coming from. I think it's coming from this bigger visual that we've created. And you know, rightfully, creating an identity is a really important thing. You know, corporations spend millions of dollars to do this, right? Or they change their identity, or they change their logo a little bit to freshen it up, whatever it is. But that really um, sustains a place, and so it's something that you have to think very carefully about as you move forward with any kind of project. Wonderful. Thank you for that answer. The next question is, is there any type of guide sheet to these sacred spaces on campus or an online information source? There is a basic listing of all the buildings on campus through the university archives. And there's a couple of guidebooks. There's one by Monsignor Lavin on St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel. And then there's a book also by a former MA in Art History, Noreen Waters, on the chapel of the seminary. Other than that, no. There are kind of little bits and pieces in the newsroom on these things over the years. That's where you find the most information. Um, we don't have, we have some pamphlets we've done over the years when I've had kids working on Heritage Day or Tommy Day or whatever we called in the past. We've made some brochures that we've had on site that day, but we haven't really put those up live anywhere. So there's, unfortunately, and maybe this needs to be fixed, probably does, um, no one place to go for information on all these things, but kind of a variety of places. But you can always be in touch with me and I can provide you with some other places to get that information. Wonderful, thank you. And the last question that we have time for is, where is your favorite sacred space? Mm. Wow, that's such a good question. I, I love to ask that question to people too. But what I think about is um, places where I have an immediate visceral reaction to the space. And one place I automatically comes to mind is this lovely little chapel called the Pazzi Chapel done by a Florentine Renaissance architect named Brunelleschi in Florence on the side of um, Santa Maria della Croce. And I walk in, it's, it's just sheer Renaissance architectural perfection. And it's not really laden with images. There are roundels with the four evangelists in at the base of the dome. Um, there's some referencing to the apostles, but the use of this kind of white walls with this Pietra Serena stone, which is kind of a brown stone there in Florence, you can get in some different colors. But I, every time I've been there, which is three times, I walk in and the tears are in the corner of my eyes. And I think it's, um, there's some time where the moment of contemplation, individual contemplation is really important for me in sacred space. But I was also up at St. John's on Saturday for a funeral of um, one of the monks up there, Father Mark Tamert. 
And that's the second funeral I've been into inside in that building that I spent a ton of time in over the years. And the monastic funeral ritual is one of the most powerful things I have ever seen. So at that point, the building almost removes itself from the process, and that's the other thing I think about with sacred space, too. It's nice to have these individual moments where there's nothing going on, and you can just contemplate and create that moment yourself. But these are buildings that house ritual, and are made because of a ritual. So you always have to experience it in that way. So I just thank you, Jenna. Well, thank, thank you, everybody you listening, for, for having me. And please do um, feel free to contact me. You can find me on the Art History website for anything you might be thinking about or if you didn't get to ask a question. And stop by the Art History Department anytime if you want to see some of our collections.